All right, today we are blessed to have a couple of friends of my wife and, and mine, me. Uh, in 1993, before all of you were born, um, Angel and I met this couple, Kevin and Ellen Harbin, from Michigan, never knowing, not anticipating we might end up in Michigan. But we met them. We were both going through the misery of having four children and going to seminary together. And we struck up this friendship that has become, if I could say it, a forever friendship. Uh, they have walked with us. We both, uh, Kevin is a pastor here in Michigan. And um, together we've walked through the challenges of being parents and making life decisions and thinking about ministry and supporting one another. So um, we know Kevin and Ellen uh, so very well and we're excited to share them with you and excited for them to share a little bit of their story as they talk about um, what it's been like to walk through toward the process of adoption. So would you stand as we get ready to worship today? Uh, we're going to pray for them after worship. Um, and we'll also, as a part of that, get to hear from one of their sons, Jalen, their youngest son, who is going to uh, share a, a, rich, or a, a number with you, and they'll explain a little bit more of that. Yeah, so. As a student body, if we would just surround them and you know, lift our voices together um, as one as we pray over the harvest today. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Harbins, God. We thank you for everything that you've done um, in and through them, God. We thank you for how your mighty works are displayed um, through all three of them. Um, Lord, as each of them share uh, what um, they have on their hearts uh, today, Lord, I pray that um, your spirit will just empower them um, and your spirit will uh, also humble us um, under your word that is spoken today, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. We're from the Detroit area. We're just a little slower over there. But uh, hey, good morning, Spring Harbor University. Glad to be with you today. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm Kevin. That's Ellen. And in a moment, you'll meet Jalen. But we're here to talk to you about uh, adoption. Next month is uh, National Adoption Month. Now, all adoption-related issues are important. And every single month, of the calendar year is significant, but November is the month that the calendar focuses as National Adoption Awareness Month, but specifically adoption through the foster care system. It was in November 2011 that our family went to the Wayne County Courts and was recognized as one of many families that had adopted in that calendar year. The news stations were there, they interviewed us, they put us on one of their segments of, uh, on their news channel. We had our moment of fame, if you will, but it wasn't a calendar that caused us to want to consider adoption. It wasn't an opportunity to be on TV that caused us to consider adoption. God was the one who motivated us for adoption. Roughly 2% of Americans are adopted one out of every 25 U.S. families with children have an adopted child, with half of those families having both biological and adopted children. About 140,000 adoptions occur each year, 86,000 out of foster care. In 2011, 
There were 2,426 children adopted from foster care here in Michigan. In that same year of 2011, two of those 2,426 children had their name changed to Harbin. When our four older kids were teenagers, Kevin and I were sitting in our den and they were in our living room with a few friends. And in an instant, our home went from loud to quiet as all the kids left to go get ice cream. And Kevin and I looked at each other and right there we decided we did not like what quiet sounded like. <laughs> now you are all way too young to understand the brevity of that particular statement. You see, we had empty nest in our sight. Now if you're the youngest in your family, then your parents are now experiencing their empty nest. Their final bird has left and the nest is now just mom and dad and they're enjoying the quiet. That's how it works for most people. But God had other plans for us Harbins. That intrusive quiet moment would one day prove to be very pivotal when God moved our hearts and he changed our minds and we made the decision to adopt. The details are many, the story is very long. So I'll fast forward to the fall of 2009. It was months after that uncomfortable, quiet moment. We had two in college and two in high school. We had just completed all the necessary criteria to adopt more children. You see, we desired at that moment that we wanted to make a dent where the greatest need was. The greatest need was to adopt out of foster care. The greatest need was to adopt children that were over five years old. The greatest need was to adopt black children. The greatest need was to adopt a sibling set. We were at the final stage of that journey, and right before our caseworker was to begin searching for children to match with our family, an upheaval hit our lives. I was diagnosed with a high-risk and aggressive form of cancer, and our adoption case file was closed. Every adoption has a story. Every adoptee has a backstory. Meanwhile, in another part of Michigan, there were two children. They were experiencing an upheaval of their own. You see, for children in foster care, every story is one of upheaval. While I was fighting to survive a cancer diagnosis, there were two children fighting to survive through the chaos of abandonment and neglect. But God always knows what he's doing. He didn't give me cancer, but he allowed that upheaval in our life to pause our adoption because he had two kids on his mind to match to our family. And the rights of their biological parents had not been terminated yet. And so though they were in the system, they weren't ready for adoption. It was the fall of 2010 when we're now ready to reopen our uh, case file. We're ready for adoption and unbeknownst to us, two children were also now becoming ready for adoption. Ellen told you her story of cancer, and she wrote a book uh, based on not only her cancer story, but also our adoption story and how God was speaking to her through all of that. She tells our st adoption story best in that book, but suffice to say, in the brief moment that I have, that God was on top of everything, and he knew what to do to bring our two families together. He had worked in our lives, he was now working in their lives, and then he brought us together. When we called to reopen our case file, little did we know that our caseworker had just said to her supervisor the week before, I have two kids that would be perfect for the Harbin house, but I can't call them. You see, legally, a caseworker cannot uh, call a family whose case is closed. They can't call to say, would you ever consider reopening it? They can't call to say, uh, when might you reopen it? But... God was already on top of that too. And our caseworker was thrilled when she heard our voices on the other end of the phone saying, we'd like to reopen our case. We were thrilled that she had two children prepared for us. She reopened the case file. We opened our hearts for these two kids. We recognized three dates in our family because when we reopened our file, she said, we've got two kids and we'd like for you to meet them. And she gave us a date. We recognize uh, three dates in our family. They're proudly proclaimed on the back of my shirt. 
There's Meet You Day, which is November 2nd, 2010. That's the date we first met them. That's coming up in just a few days. Then there's Gotcha Day, which is December 18th, 2010, which is the day they moved in. It felt like forever. It was the beginning of forever, but adoption can't take place until six months after that day. And then, of course, there is the Adoption Day, which for us happened on July 7th, 2011. Initially in a courtroom in Lapeer, Michigan, uh, the judge took his time to make it special, even though it could have been done in just moments. But he made it special for Jalen. He made it special for Sakanya by asking them a lot of questions to involve them, like, do you want to be adopted? And do you want to be adopted? By them. But uh, in the midst of it, what seemed like a long time, probably was only about 15 minutes. And then at that moment, the judge pounded his gavel and he made the announcement that Jalen and Sukanya were now legally Harbin's family forever. Adoption. It's a legal term which means the action of legally taking another's child and bringing it up as one's own. Adoption means leaving one's natural family and entering into the privileges and the responsibilities of another. We were the ones now legally charged to bring them up as our own. To make it special, we held a birth certificate party where all six Harbin kids were now together and they had an opportunity to look at each of their own birth certificates. One by one, each would read their name, read their date of birth, read their city and state of birth, and then also their parents' names. What a sweet moment it was for us to listen to Jalen and Sakanya when they spoke their name for the first time. It can be common for kids when they're adopted into new families to change their first name, the middle name, maybe everything, just as a separation from their past. But their first names we loved, but we did give them new middle names. Jalen Joseph Harbin and Sukanya Rose Harbin. Jalen because of the Old Testament uh, character Joseph, because what man meant for harm, God would use for good. And Sukanya Rose Harbin, the rose, the prize flower in every garden, most beautiful. It was sweet to see their faces as they realized they shared the same last name and that they shared the same parents as their older siblings, Christine and Andrew and Eric and Troy. And now just a moment to give a little shout out to Eric and Troy who were Spring Arbor grads just a short while ago. But now the Harbin family is legal. There are eight of us, and eight is enough. <laughs> Legally adopted means they share in all things. It means that they share in all inheritance rights too. Now, some of you might not be thinking about your inheritances right now. You're just hoping your student loans get paid off. But an inheritance means this. You get a share of all your parents' stuff, the cars, the house, the cash. So when I approached our older four kids about sharing their inheritances, of course, I had to joke about it a little bit to say, I know what you're thinking. You're going to have to share your inheritance instead of four ways. Now it's got to be spread six ways. But I might want you to just consider our situation. You might actually be spreading our debt load out from four to six. <laughs> Some of you might want to go home and say, hey, pops, mom, uh, inheritance or debt? Which am I getting? <laughs> Adoption, it's, a, it's another word, it's a legal word, but it's also a spiritual word. Adoption has spiritual implications. Consider this, God has no natural children. God only has adopted children. Ephesians chapter one in the uh, paraphrase translation says it best in the message paraphrase. It says, long, long ago, he meaning God, God decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning all this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving hand by his beloved son. Adoption into God's family only comes through his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 12 might describe that best. 
yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You don't leave the family that you were born into to join this one. You still retain all legal rights and inheritances of your earthly biological family. But now you have a second family, a spiritual one. And those that are in it get to know family prayer, just like we sang a moment ago, where we get to pray the family prayer and say, Our Father, who art in heaven... And get this, especially if you're an only child out there, there are no only children in the family of God. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. Adoption, it's a biblical word. It's a family word that God uses to describe the process of salvation and all its benefits. And in God's economy, there is no simply forever. There's eternal. So family with God is not just forever. It is eternal. God the Father graciously accepts children, believers in Christ, into his family and grants them all the privileges as heirs. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says it this way. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We share in his glory. That's the good stuff. But we also share in his sufferings. That's the bad stuff. More often than not, we don't read about that part or want to talk about that part. The Bible contains two powerful stories of adoption and the significance that they have on each of us. The first you're probably familiar with, Jesus. The second, however, is Moses. Every one of us has a past. Our past is set in history. Therefore, Anything about our stories from this moment looking backwards cannot and will not change. However, God can affect how our past can change us moving forward. In Acts chapter 7, verses 20 through 21, we have a snapshot of adoption. It says this, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for in his father's house. And then Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. You see, Moses has a past. Moses also has a backstory. Through it, we learn that God provides a clear path, a fresh perspective, and a personalized plan. The detailed story of Moses is found in the book of Exodus. Before his birth, we can read in Exodus chapter 1 of God's people, the Israelites, who were living in Egypt. That particular story also has a backstory. Egypt was ruled by a pharaoh, and this pharaoh was extremely intimidated by the Israelites. He noticed that they kept multiplying in number. That also has a particular backstory. But the pharaoh devised a plan. He wanted to deal shrewdly with the Israelites. You see, if he could work them hard, and if he turned them into his slaves, then war would not break out, and his kingdom would not be threatened. So he thought if he could contain them, he could control them. So he set a plan in motion. His first plan, slavery. Shortened lifespans, broken spirits, and that would mean exhausted people. Therefore, less relations and less babies born. Did you get that? Less relations because they're wore out and tired. Less babies born. Now, if we step back from the narrative, then we will see God's redemptive hand at work. Sometimes we remain stuck in our past story, and we need to take that step back so that we can gain a fresh perspective to look for that clear path of provision that God provides so that he can reveal his personalized plan for each of us so that we can become conduits of God's amazing grace and his unlimited mercy, exhibiting the saving power of our sovereign, almighty, omniscient, and awesome Lord. Plan number one, failed. You see, the more that the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, 
the more that the Israelites multiplied and spread. So the Pharaoh came up with plan number two. It's called extermination and elimination. And in the middle of that plan, he called two Hebrew midwives who were in charge of the labor and delivery department of the Israelite camp. And they were brought into Pharaoh's court and he ordered an edict to be carried out. And he said this to those two women, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth, if it's a boy, kill him. But Exodus 1, 17 informs us they did not do what the Pharaoh told them to do. Now, when we read stories from the Bible like they're fiction, then we only see a good narrative and heroes to applaud. But God does not tell their story so that we applaud their behavior. You see, it's not for our education or our entertainment. It is for the sake of emulation. You see, these women were brave, and there were other brave people in the Israelite camp. They were courageous. They were steadfast. They were strong, and we should imitate their bravery. I believe that in today's culture, bravery has been hijacked. We call a lot of things brave that are not brave. We get tattoos. We change our hair color. We follow whatever's trending. That's not brave. Doing what's right, standing up for truth, and trusting your past to Jesus, now that's bravery. Other brave folks were facing opposition with bravery at this time. There were two people, a man and his wife. Amram and Jochebed were married. They had two children, and Jochebed became pregnant with her third but the order to kill all baby boys was still sanctioned. Now, I'm sure throughout her pregnancy, she hoped for a girl, but she bravely planned like she knew it was a boy. In Exodus 2.2, it tells us that when she saw her baby, she saw that he was a fine child. You know, there are a lot of mamas that look at their babies and say, oh, look at you. I know you are just something special. That is not what that means. You see, it's more than that. She saw what God revealed to her to see. Godly perspective made her eyes see and her heart understand that there was something extraordinary about this child. You see, it was not Jochebed's responsibility to raise her son as she saw fit. It was her assignment to protect this boy for God's purposes. God gave Jochebed a fresh perspective because he had a personalized plan for Moses already set in motion. If you're familiar with this account, then you know how this plan went down. She made a basket, a vessel of safety for her baby boy, and she placed her son in it, and she set it afloat amongst the reeds of the Nile River. Now your story, your past, it may be hard. It may be difficult. It could be sad and troubling. But that doesn't change who God is. And he desires to show you his clear path for you. He desires to give you a fresh perspective. And he so wants to reveal his personalized plan for you. When we wonder why things happen the way that they did, when we wish that things would have been different, when we question why God doesn't meet up to our expectation of a rescue operation, then we become stuck waiting as if our past will change when God wants to change us. Everyone has a past. Consider yours. And if you were adopted, this story drives deeper and has unique connotations for you. In Acts chapter 7, verse 21, it says this, then Pharaoh's daughter took Moses. So the question is, Did the princess rescue a baby or did God deliver Moses into the palace for his purpose? When I became mama to Jalen and Sukanya, God revealed to me that I did not rescue my children out of foster care. We adopted them. God delivered them. I did not save my adopted children from anything. I was called to be their mama. And for nine years, that's what I've been. The princess, she took Moses. This word took literally means that at that very moment, she took ownership of him. Kevin already said that Micha Day is just coming up in a couple of days, November 2nd, 2010. At the corner of Utica Road and 15 Mile in suburban Detroit sits a McDonald's. It's where we met Jalen and Sukanya for the very first time. However, I loved them before I saw them. 
I took ownership of them. When our caseworker called and said, I have these two kids. And my heart exploded with love for these two unknown, unnamed, unseen kids. And they owned a place in my heart. And I owned the fact that they were my son and my daughter. I took Jalen and Sukanya up just like Pharaoh's daughter took Moses up. And then Acts chapter 7 verse 21 goes on to say, and she brought him up as her own. Moses was now a part of her family. Her palace became his home and her people became his people. We take them up into our families, but it's God who is the one who places them where he wills. The Greek word for adoption literally means to place as a son or place as a daughter. The other adoption in the scriptures is, of course, Jesus. God placed Jesus as a son to Joseph. Now, Mary, she would be told that she would bear a son, but he won't be his son, Joseph's. When people look at Jesus, they're going to look at Mary and say, Mary, I see his looks in you. And then they're going to look at Joseph and say, Joseph, I don't see any resemblance whatsoever. When we adopted, we specifically wanted kids that did not look like us. Jalen and Sukanya might not look like us, but they have started to act like us and talk like us because Harbins were loud and they're loud. I wonder in Mary and Joseph's story when they stop talking about the miraculous conception story because there comes a time when the words adopted stop being used. They're not adopted anymore. They're just a part of your family. When you raise adopted children, you have to be convinced and have a convinced attitude that God was at work in placing them into your family just like your own biological children Family is God's idea. Have any of you discovered that family life is complicated? Whether biological, blended, or adoptive, families have issues. We share in all things, the inheritances, that's the good stuff. We get to share in the sufferings too, and that's the tough stuff. Whether blended, biological, or adoptive, families have issues We all have issues to deal with. I wonder how that played out in Moses' story. I wonder how that played out in Jesus' story. It's there in the scriptures, but that's not the focus of this message. Families have issues. Churches have issues. And remember, what is a church except a gathering of people? A gathering of people who happen to call upon him as father and know each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. The Apostle Paul spends much of his time writing the New Testament, talking to his brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, stop it. Not much has changed, has it? Churches still have problems. Brothers and sisters in Christ have problems with each other. But let's bring this just a little bit closer to home. Any of you having a problem at home? Any of you struggling with family issues? Any of you ever wish you were in a different family? Any of you, when you were just a little bit younger, said, oh, I wish your family would adopt me? You were prepared to leave yours to enter somebody else's. If those are your thoughts, you weren't the first and you won't be the last. You spoke out of your hurt. And if there's a thousand people in here, statistics says, but simply reality says that someone in here is struggling with their family. Someone in here is having a hard time getting along with mom or dad or siblings. There's one person missing in our gathering today. It's our daughter, Sukanya. Ellen's gonna tell you a little bit about Jalen, but let me tell you about my daughter, Sukanya. She's 14 years old. She is smart. When she enters into a room, she lights up the room. She has a smile that's contagious and a laughter that's loud. She's talented. She can play the flute like none other. She has so much to offer. But for a while lately, she's been dealing with her hurts. Hurts in her life and well, there's an old phrase that says, hurting people hurt people. And she's hurting herself. And she's hurting her family. Choices that could be made that just simply aren't being made to 
stop it. I wish I could tell you that this all wasn't true, but it is. You know, when you're asked to come and speak an adoption, don't you think your chaplain, Brian, would do a little bit better job at finding a family that could come up here and tell you how good and easy adoption is? A family who can share their happily ever after story? But for the moment, that's not our story that we hope it will be. But right now, it isn't. Adoption is hard. Family life is hard. Parents of biological kids can joke about giving them back, but we don't. And parents of adoptive children can be tempted in just the same way. But when you know that it was God who placed them as a son, placed them as a daughter in your family, you don't. Because family, it's forever. When convinced that God is the one in control, that he is the one who placed them in your family, you don't give up. Maybe someone here, because of your family situation, feels like giving up. You weren't adopted. It's not even a blended family. It's your biological family, but you have choices to make also. We're convinced that adoption wasn't our idea. It was God's. Someone recently encouraged us that God knew what he was doing by placing these kids in our homes, that they were given the right parents, and that we have all the necessary tools to help them to deal with their issues. Maybe you don't feel that way in your family right now. Sakanya doesn't feel that way right now in our family. We pray that she would have a fresh perspective on her past and believe that God has a personalized plan for her future. Maybe someone here needed to hear that today too. When we first met Jalen, he hummed all the time. He hummed harmonies. He hummed in the van, in the grocery store. He was not allowed to hum in school or at the dinner table. God provided this humming path of survival for our son. Humming soothed him, and it obviously soothed his sister Sukanya as well because she never one time asked him to stop. She never claimed annoyance over his loud droning. One day, about a year after they became a part of our family, we came home from church, and Kevin and I were in the living room. Jalen and Sukanya were in a bedroom when we heard music coming from a toy keyboard. Real music, as in like a song we had just sung that Sunday morning in church. Come to find out it was Jalen playing by ear. And the next two Sundays, the same thing happened. Kevin and I might be a bit slow, because it took us about three weeks before we said, you know what, we should probably get this boy some piano lessons. Today, Jalen is 16. Would you like to hear and see how God gave a clear path to a broken boy, a fresh perspective to the humming, and a personalized plan to our son, Jalen Joseph Harbin. He will be playing a piece arranged by your very own, Mrs. Audra Jean Heidenberg, Assistant Professor of Music. Jalen, thank you for your willingness to share what God is doing in and through you as you play To God Be the Glory with etude in C minor.
Thank you, Jalen. So I, want, I just want to thank the Harbins uh, for sharing a little bit of their story. You know, you may be surprised at how many people are adopted, even in, or a part of foster care, even in this, in this community. Every time I turn around, I feel like I'm talking to someone who says, yeah, like I was adopted, or we've adopted, our family adopted uh, someone into our family. Or, um, so I, I want to share that because I believe that is a, a very significant part of what the kingdom of God looks like. Um, not not just as something that God has done for us, but something that the, the people of, who are the church can continue to do. Um, the numbers of persons who graduate out of the foster care system is astounding, and to think that they never have a forever family uh, breaks my heart. So um, just wanted you to hear a perspective, a fresh perspective, a clear path, a fresh perspective, and uh, potentially think about what God's personalized plan is for you in expanding your kingdom your family, thinking that this is a bit of an adoptive family as well. So uh, let me pray for us as we head out into our day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Harbins and the way that you have um, expanded the kingdom of God through their lives, uh, through ministry and through family. Pray that you will uh, continue to use them in in incredible ways and give us a a bigger perspective of how you are working in this kingdom. Uh, Thank you for meeting us here today, and would you go with us into the rest of our day. Help us to honor you and bring you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.